We'll find out. All right, guys. Uh, thank you very much for coming to Grand Rounds. I have the pleasure of of doing Grand Rounds uh, today, um, and this I guess I haven't done Grand Rounds since 2010 when we started Grand Rounds. The first Grand Rounds, Cancer Grand Rounds we had, I did with uh, David Stern. And today I'm delighted to be doing them with Katie Politi. And what I'm going to do is take you through first, um, clinically, where we are in treating EGFR mutation positive lung cancer. Review the clinical data. And then Katie's going to take us through and understand the preclinical data that explains why we're not able to cure every patient with EGFR mutation positive lung cancer. Most important, Katie's going to show us the way to how we will be able to cure every patient with EGFR mutation positive lung cancer. So it has now been 10 years since the initial descri uh, description of EGFR mutations. And are we any closer to a cure at this point? This is my disclosure slide. Uh, Board of Directors of BMS, Scientific Advisory Board of Arvinus, and uh, have patents through Partners Healthcare uh, for EGFR mutation testing. So epidermal growth factor receptor mutations, as you know, are more common in people with adenocarcinoma, women, and never smokers. And they tend to be either exon 19 deletions or exon 21 point mutations. These are activating mutations that also explain the remarkable sensitivity of EGFR mutated lung cancer to drugs like erlotinib and gefitinib and efatinib and the other kinase inhibitors. So uh, just to remind you, the way that I was involved with this was to a patient from Yale, actually initially, a woman named Kate Robbins, who was diagnosed with widely metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. She had a smashing response to gefitinib, and people wondered, well, gosh, uh, why was that? And um, we put this article on the front page of the Globe. It was then, and, and you know, we like to talk about, I keep telling Steve Gore how important it is for us to have multidisciplinary committees that meet and talk about science and focus on the interaction between science and clinical. But really, basically, a guy woke up in the morning, read the paper, and this is Daniel Haber, uh, woke up, read the paper, and had this eureka moment that EGFR mutations must be underlining this. Uh, this underlying, this incredible responsiveness. And so Dan called me on the phone and said, Tom, I'm pretty sure your patient has an exon 19 deletion in EGFR. Please send me her tissue. So I sent him 10 patients' tissues that had these great responses. And he was absolutely right. Uh, that that's exactly what under, uh, that, that explained the remarkable, um, the remarkable activity. So Daniel reached uh, this conclusion on 11-2503. Now, this story was being pursued in two other laboratories at almost exactly the same time. Um, and uh, Katie was actually part of the laboratory of Dr. Hal Varmus, who had identified EGFR mutations, and the laboratory of Dr. Matthew Meyerson, uh, that was actually screening the entire kinome for mutations in lung cancer. And they also found EGFR mutations. Um, our paper appeared way in advance of these other papers. Um, it was 24 hours ahead of the Farber paper. And I think it was two and a half weeks ahead of the memorial paper, which clearly shows that we were way out in front um, of these other two sites. Um, but one other interesting point is we were not the first people to describe EGFR mutations. The first person to describe an EGFR mutation was um, in lung cancer was David Carbone. Many of you may know David. He's now at Ohio State. Before this, he was at, um, at uh, Vanderbilt. And David actually had a patient who had this remarkable response to ERISA, was put on ERISA, great response, disease progresses in the liver, they do a liver biopsy, sequences it, they find an exon 19 deletion, and he said, aha, this is a resistance mutation, just like my friend Brian talks about in CML. We found a resistance mutation. So he and his postdocs wrote it up. Um, David was pursuing his immunotherapy interests, not really working on signaling at the time. He wrote it up, published it in AACR as a routine communication to AACR, and it was an uh, abstract at AACR and a poster uh, for the postdoc. But he was the first person to describe exon 19 deletions. What he didn't recognize was that they were actually activating and not resistance uh, mutations in that setting. So once the mutations were discovered, it then came to putting them into patients. And the one great thing about this conference, it draws a lot of younger 
uh, people to the conference. Not everybody's been practicing medicine for 25 years. This was one. Of, this was the initial study in the U.S. of upfront gefitinib in patients with metastatic non-small cell. It was done by Alicia Sequist, who was my fellow and then became an attending at the MGH. This is a patient of Bruce Johnson's with a right upper lobe tumor, fluorofusion and right upper lobe tumor with a 858 point mutation, identified up front, treated with ERISA, very nice response. Now, the young people are saying, what's such a big deal about that? That's pretty obvious, pretty easy. When we started this, it was not clear that you could get turnaround on EGFR mutations in a way that could allow you to pick treatments based on it. Now, Jeff Squar is wondering, why couldn't you? Of course, Jeff can turn these around in about two hours now. But that wasn't the case in 2005, 2006, 2007. It would take four to six weeks to get an EGFR mutation report back. And you had to pick patients who you thought could live four to six weeks before they actually got treated. So it was actually very challenging at that point. And this was the paper that Leisha published way back in 2008. And you can see very nice response. And what's so incredible about this now is you think about waterfall pots, we have become in lung cancer so friggin, are you allowed to use that word here? Yeah, you can use, you can't, okay, no. So bloody, can you use bloody? Not really either that either, okay. Um, we've become really jaded, okay, about, um, about waterfall plots. These kinds of things, when I was a fellow, even go back to Howard, you never saw a waterfall plot like this in solid tumors. We were happy if we had a response. We'd be ha happy if somebody had stable disease, prolonged stable disease we're making a big deal out of. So these kind of waterfall plots, this was one of the first ones in lung cancer that showed this kind of response rate overall in non-small cells. So what led to this becoming an adopted accepted therapy? This is the uh, IPASS study from Hong Kong, randomized trial in a surrogate marker. So even in 2007, 2008, we were using a surrogate marker for mutations because Nobody felt you could ever test people real time in a way that you could put them on a clinical trial. And so these were patients who were chemo naive. It was done in, in Hong Kong, so they were all, or in China, they were all Asian, adenocarcinoma, light or never smokers. Most of these people were women. Randomized to gefitinib or carbotaxol. And what this showed was the response rate uh, was higher to gefitinib than it was to carbotaxol in the all-comers population. And he looked at mutation-positive patients, 71% to gefitinib, 47% to carbotaxol. For our fellows, I think one of the key things to remember, you can treat an EGFR mutation-positive patient with chemotherapy, and you're not doing any disservice to them. They still have a very good chance of responding, 40, 35 to 45% chance of responding. The problem is, if it's an EGFR mutation negative patient, they have a very poor chance of responding to EGFR uh, based treatment. So this led really to um, <clears throat> us using testing to drive treatment. It was an important part of personalized medicine for lung cancer because it led us to realize you have to test. Because if you can't test, you probably should start with chemotherapy, not start with, um, with gefitinib or targeted therapy. Progression-free survival was also better in the mutation-positive group compared to the mutation, and then it, it was better in the mutation-positive group, and in the mutation-negative group, those who got gefitinib did very poorly. And so, it, and again, for the fellows' standpoint, go back to 2007, 2008, you guys were probably in college at the time, maybe, maybe beginning medical school, and at that point, we were often, if we saw an Asian woman, I know, Peter was like only two R01s ago, um, but if, but if you saw an Asian woman never smoker, we would in, in up front often start these patients on gefitinib or allotinib without testing them. And so this changed our practice in that area. Now, what didn't change in this trial was overall survival. And this has been a major concern and criticism of this type of study because we haven't been able to show overall survival benefits. And one of the reasons we haven't is because of the enormous crossover that happens in this patient population. Virtually everybody goes on to get treated with oral TKIs after having chemotherapy. So it's impossible in these trials to really show a substantial survival benefit. And I think equally important is the idea that quality of life was better. So whether you look at total fact or any of the indexes that are used in lung cancer, you see the quality of life was better for the group that received gefitinib versus chemotherapy. Now throughout the rest of the world, 
Gefitinib is approved and used in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. That's EGFR mutation positive. It's not used in the United States because it's not approved in the US, but in Asia and Europe, it's a very common treatment uh, for these diseases, along with um, erlotinib and afatinib. So the URTAC study, and then of course this came out, and the biggest thing that people came out and said, well, Tom, it's not really generalizable, it's done in Asians. We need to see it done in Caucasians to know that it's not just an Asian phenomenon, which in my mind is insane, okay? It's a genetic phenomenon not a racial phenomenon. So it was done in, in Caucasians, mostly Caucasian population, in the URTAC study. Patients were randomized to dealer's choice of cystocytaxel or cisgem versus erlotinib, and the results were very similar to that seen uh, with, with this, maybe slightly lower numbers, but very similar trends. And Lux Lung 3 and Lux Lung 6 are the big BI studies using a fatinib, and again, very similar trends, very similar results. Uh, showing um, a benefit to a fatinib in the first line. And Lux Lung 3 and 6 were global studies done both in Asia, US, and Europe. So whether you choose to fitinib or lotinib or a fatinib, all three are good choices. We all know what the side effects are. Rash, diarrhea, small risk of liver problems, and a risk of interstitial pneumonitis. Don't forget the interstitial pneumonitis for the fellows who are treating new patients with lung cancer. If they get short of breath, it may not necessarily mean that the cancer is progressing. It could mean that they're getting interstitial pneumonitis uh, from the drugs themselves. So um, I actually had a slide in here, which is not, for some reason, not showing up at the right order. Um, but looking at the survival of patients treated on a fatinib, for the first time at ASCO this year, there was a combined analysis of the two fatinib studies that actually showed a trend favoring survival to being treated with a fatinib first line. Now, is afatinib better than erlotinib or gefitinib? I think that's impossible to say. I don't think anyone could responsibly say that. I think all three of those drugs are good choices, and I think if you want to choose afatinib, that's great. If you want to choose erlotinib, that's great. If you want to choose gefitinib if you live in Asia or in, in Europe, that's also great. So that brings us to the question of what do you do when these drugs stop working? Because when you look at the progression-free survival, even in the best cases, we're looking at about a year. It's about a year before these diseases progress um, and, and cause all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of problems. Roy, that's my Diet Coke right next to me. I know you're going to try to take it. Okay. Because all of you guys know, never let a Diet Coke anywhere near Dr. Herb. Okay? Or you'll never see it again. Um, so uh, what do you do when these drugs stop working? Well, this is work, uh, and Katie's probably going to take us through some of the science behind it in just a second. But what do you do when they stop working? Well, this is a very nice paper that Katie and William Powell worked on when they were with, um, with Harold Marmus that showed if you use the combination of, of a fatinib, which is the irreversible, the difference between a fatinib and gefitinib or lotinib, it's irreversible. Use the irreversible inhibitor plus the, anti plus, plus the uh, antibodies, tuximab, you can actually get responses in patients who progress. So it shows that second line therapy can actually work. And so here we see what the waterfall curve looks like whether your resistance is driven by T790M or is not driven by T790M, you can still see beautiful responses. And Katie will share with us some of her thinking and understanding of why that looks promising. So here we have a treatment that works in second line, okay, meaning patients who, de who develop resistance. Would this be better in first line? And that's where we tell the story of Sarah Goldberg and Katie Politi. Uh, Sarah and Katie, as you all know, are here at Yale. This is a study that we hope is going to get approved. Um, it's taking a long time to get through the NCI uh, process. This is a randomized phase 2-3 trial of fatinimus in first-line patients who have not been treated with mutation-positive non-small cell lung cancer. And we're very excited about this trial. This is a randomized trial between a fatinimus and a fatinib alone. Now, <clears throat> a couple of things. The reason it's phase 2-3 is because this combination hasn't been used up front in patients, we think we need some tolerability data to make sure that it's tolerated safely because we do know there's more rash and there's more diarrhea if you use cetuximab and a fatinib compared to just a fatinib alone. We want to make sure this is tolerated by patients. And so we have to sort of get a sense of that. One of the observations has been when you use these drugs in second line, they tend to be a little better tolerated because there's a little bit of a phenomena of burnout of the rash and diarrhea 
in patients like this. So it may have a slightly different toxicity profile in first line. Katie, I mean, uh, Sarah, do you worry about that? And where does this stand now with the NCI process? Submitted today. Oh, perfect. Okay. Timing is ideal. Okay, excellent. So um, this is from a paper that Alice Shaw published in the JCO uh, last year. And it, it doesn't show every mechanism of resistance, but it gives us a sense of some of the mechanisms of resistance. And um, you're going to hear from Katie in a second about her perspective on the mechanism of resistance. But this is just point, to point out that there's many reasons that first generation TKIs don't work. Probably the most important are mutations in T790M. T790M is a secondary mutation. And T790M mutations account for, we believe, about 50% of secondary resistance and probably about 3 to 5% of primary resistance to tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But you can have alterations in HER2, either amplification or mutation. You can have PI3 kinase mutations. You can have HGF uh, overproduction. You can have MET amplification mutations in RAF. And you can also have EMT, epithelial mesenchymal transformation. Or <clears throat> you can have small cell phenotype, which can occur. So one of the things I think is very important in the context of resistance is a commitment to rebiopsying. One of the things I think that Roy can say we're most proud of here at the Yale Cancer Center has been the rebiopsying effort that Scott Gettinger, I don't know if Scott's here, but that Scott Gettinger has led uh, with Katie in the lung cancer program to rebiopsy patients when they became resistant. If you don't study why someone's resistant, it's hard to guide the next generation of therapy. And now that Jeff Sklar is able to do uh, impressive molecular profiling, more than just EGFR mutation testing, we're able to test a number of different areas in this uh, signaling cascade to get a sense of what could be accounting for the various different mechanisms of resistance in a patient. So can we make first generation TKIs better? Uh, you know, I told you about a fatinib plus a tuximab. What about the other ones? What about erlotinib and, and gefitinib? And this is a slide I made for ASCO this year. All of these studies have been published either in paper or abstract form. As you can see, erlotinib. And these are a number of different efforts to try to improve outcome. And possibly with the exception of bevacizumab, and that goes back to an idea that Dr. Herbst had. God, it must be 10 years now. Uh, on the, on the uh, erlotinib, but what, maybe 15 years now at this point. Um, with the exception of bevacizumab, and I think we have some data from ASCO this year that suggests that erlotinib and bevacizumab actually might work better together than just erlotinib alone. The remainder of these, particularly the, two, the, the dual signaling inhibitors, have been both poorly tolerated and ineffective in this setting. So very challenging to try to overcome resistance in this, in this setting. But there's a second way to do it. And the second way to do it is to develop inhibitors that are mutation specific. So the three drugs I told you about, afatinib, erlotinib, gefitinib, were designed to inhibit wild type EGFR. What if you had an inhibitor that was designed to inhibit mutant EGFR? Okay? And that's what these three drugs were presented at ASCO this year. The HM drug, Clovis, and AZD. These three drugs actually have very modest activity against wild type, but impressive activity against mutants. So you can actually select a way and have much less rash, much less diarrhea, and hopefully more activity against the mutant receptor. What about the first drug, HM61713? Uh, it's an irreversible mutant-specific inhibitor. It's performed principally, HM is a Korean pharmaceutical company, uh, performed uh, principally in a Korean population. They included T790M resistant and T790M negative patients. And they required that everybody have an immediate prior TKI before going on treatment. Now, why is that important? We know that if you've been off TKI for a year, six months, you can sometimes get retreatment responses. And Katie and Scott and I and, and Roy have seen a lot of these retreatment responses that you get from being exposed to TKI second time around. So this was preliminary data, but it showed clear activity. The side effects were rash and diarrhea much milder than the first generation TKIs. Some patients just developed a transient dipsia, shortness of breath, which was a concern. Now what about the Clovis drug, uh, CO1686? 
And this drug is in study at Dana-Farber. It's an irreversible EGFR inhibitor, inhibitor relative sparing of wild type, very strong preclinical activity versus T790M. And the early development of this drug was impacted by the variable solubility of the free base formulation. And, and I can see Paul and Pat sitting next to each other. All they think about all day is hydrobromide salt and how to overcome free base problems, okay? And how to make drugs more soluble and get them to be, to get them to be uptake, uh, to taken up. As you can imagine, variable solubility of a drug is actually worse than poor solubility of a drug because you never know exactly how to dose it because Mrs. Johnson might get a huge effect and Mrs. Smith might get a much lower effect. So you want something that's consistent and when the hydrobromide salt was created, that reduced the variability and allowed dosing. The Clovis drug is BID. There was only 4% grade one rash. There was 22% diarrhea, but none was grade three. They developed hyperglycemia and they all received uh, oral, anti oral uh, anti-diabetic agents. Many received that with it. And there was some QTC prolongation. One of the things that uh, Paul Ader will tell me from his time working at AstraZeneca is QTC prolongation is a kiss of death. Do you still agree with that? Unless it's a true first in class. <laughs> you can get away with it sometimes. Okay. So, and again, it's asymptomatic, but it, it can be very difficult because then it makes it more challenging to combine these drugs. But look at the response rate. They had 40 T790M positive patients. The response rate was 58%, and it worked against patients with brain meds. This was the progression-free survival at ASCO which, again, very early, can't really make much of that at this point. And finally, AZD9291, which is in study here at Yale. Roy, who's the PI of this trial? Sarah. Sarah Goldberg is the PI of this trial, of AZT9291. Um, an irreversible mutant selective TKI. Um, we heard about a global phase one trial uh, where patients were entered uh, via the Jackman criteria, meaning we're progressing while on drug. This is a QD drug. 68% response rate in T790M patients. And again, a very promising early um, uh, PFS. ILD was also seen in some of these patients, both Asian and non-Asian. And at the 80 milligram dose, 20% diarrhea and slightly more rash, 27% uh, rash. But there was no hyperglycemia or QTC. And the response rate appears again, a little bit higher here in the T790Ms than in the T790 negatives. So the question is, how have we improved treatment? When one looks at a fat cetuximab, now these are all of our second line options. A fat cetuximab versus HM versus Clovis versus AZD. The response rate, if you've got T790M, appears to be better for Clovis and AZD. Beware any appears to be better comparison of phase twos. It's not fair. It may not be true when you do a phase three trial. In, but it's all we have. So we tend to do it. Response rate in T790M uh, uh, negative patients appears to be uh, seen in a fat nib and seen in AZD, a little bit incomplete for Clovis uh, at this point, inconclusive at this point. And the PFS appears to be best for the Clovis AZD drug. So these drugs look promising. I think the role that a fat nib tuximab will play is probably in, in both T790M and possibly in first line. We don't have first line data for either Clovis or AZD yet. What about side effects? Well, the, the, the uh, mutant selectives seem to have less side effects. Look at the diarrhea rate. Erlotinib, afatinib, cetuximab, between 50 and 70% drops to 20% with the new selectives. Rash, 80, 90% drops to 4 to 25% in that setting. And then you've got these quirky QTC and increased blood sugar um, uh, rates as well, so unclear exactly what that means. I want to uh, finish with a couple of comments about increasing the cure rate. We've been talking about cure rates today. This is the Radiant trial that was presented at ASCO by uh, Dr. Shepard and Dr. Kelly. One of the important things here is this is a randomized adjuvant trial between erlotinib and placebo in patients who had EGFR IHC positivity for the fellows. Not helpful. 90% of lung cancers have EGFR IHC positivity. But they look specifically at the EGFR mutation positive subgroup. And what they found was the disease-free survival for erlotinib was substantially longer than placebo. The numbers were very small, even though there was an excellent hazard ratio. It was not statistically significant due to hierarchical 
uh, testing. So, so it's, it's a subgroup analysis. We've got to be a little bit careful. But what this does is when you have a patient who comes in now with an EGFR mutation, it does cause you pause and make you think, should you consider treating that patient with erlotinib or fatinib or gefitinib in, uh, as a adjuvant therapy to, to definitive therapy at that point? And the last thing on treating this is just a, uh, an idea that from Scott Gettinger, and this is some work that he shared with me, is that there's activity of both anti-PD-1 and anti-PDL-1 in EGFR mutants. And would this make sense in this setting? And I think one of the biggest dilemmas we see when we see a patient in clinic who comes in with an EGFR mutation positive uh, story, do you put them on TKIs or do you think about putting them on an immunotherapy trial? Kwok Wong from Dana-Farber using his murine models has suggested that act activation of the PD-1 pathway might be important um, uh, in EGFR-driven lung cancers. And again, the big question is how do we integrate these as we go forward? Scott has been one of the leaders in doing studies looking at, this, at these drugs in this group of patients. So that gives you a lead up to try to understand where we are in treating these patients. I think we've come a tremendous way in 10 years, but I think it's hard to say that we're routinely curing patients who have this. I think one of the things I like to say, the same thing, uh, the last statement I'll make is the same last statement I made four years ago, which is the index patient that we discovered EGFR mutations in is still alive 14 years later. It's a long time. 14 years later on gefitinib. And there are still about 100 patients in the United States still on gefitinib who were started back in 2004. Now, there were millions treated, so that tells you how few live that many years. But it's not impossible. I would put uh, that it's close to what Dr. Hoxter is doing in pancreas cancer in terms of all the Whipple procedures and the Fulfirinox, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure how many of those patients are still there uh, 15 years from now. But again, one of the things to remember, this is the, it might be the 10th anniversary of finding mutations. It's the fifth anniversary of the Smilo Cancer Hospital. I want to thank all of you for the contributions and commitment you've been making to the hospital. This weekend's Closer to Free Ride, I think, was one of the high points of our time at Smilo. It was a spectacular community event. And the research that goes on here every day and the clinical care that goes on here every day is incredibly motivating. A great example of that research is the work done by Katie Politi. Dr. Politi, exactly 1229. Uh -oh. <laughs>